the month of August is a very Marian month. You have the great feast of the dedication of St. Mary Major, the feast of Our Lady of the Snows. On August 5th, you have the tremendous solemnity of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary on August 15th. And then you have the Feast of Our Lady of Knock on August 21st. And of course, most recently, we celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary on August 22nd. In fact, the entire month of August is dedicated to that devotion, to that Immaculate Heart of Our Lady. And so with this in mind, I would like to have our devotional discussion this particular month be on Our Lady, in particular, her Immaculate Conception, her singular privilege of being conceived without stain of original sin in the womb of her mother, St. Anne. But to begin this discussion on that singular privilege of the Immaculate Conception, I'd like to talk about one particular false apparition. In June, of 1981, six young people from Croatia went up a hill near the village of Magigori in what was then rural Yugoslavia. When the six youngsters came down, they said that they had seen, quote unquote, the gospa, the Croat word for lady. The local bishop was initially open to their claims of seeing the Blessed Mother, but after he interviewed them and learned the full story, he knew that it was a complete hoax. As the years have passed since that time, and the false reports of the apparitions have continued, there has been more and more evidence of the full deception and fraud surrounding the idol of Magigori. Let's begin with the glaring theological errors in connection with this false apparition. The error of religious indifferentism is present within this false apparition. In a sense, it's as if the Madonna has embraced Freemasonry. The Isle of Magigori stated to the supposed visionaries that, quote, all religions are equal before God, unquote. The false messenger continued with the revelation that, quote, the Muslims and the Orthodox, like the Catholics, are equal before my son and before me, for you are all my children, unquote. Even though the Catholic Church is not a denomination, but rather the one true religion outside of which no one can be saved, the false idol taught differently, stating that, quote, God directs all denominations as a king directs his subjects through the medium of his ministers, unquote. In fact, the gospel claimed that the holiest person in the local villages in and around Magigori was an unbaptized, idolatrous Muslim woman named Pasha, who excelled all the baptized in holiness. The errors of this false apparition are also seen in regard to the sinlessness of the Virgin and her role as mediatrix of all graces and all intercession. Unlike at Lourdes, the apparition at Lourdes, the true apparition, where the Blessed Mother only prayed the Apostles' Creed and the Glory Be during her recitation of the Holy Rosary. At Medjugorje, the idol prays the prayer of sinners, namely the Our Father, where the harlot of Medjugorje asks that her trespasses be forgiven. Seriously? When asked by the six young people if they and others should approach the Blessed Mother for her, her, for her intercession, knowing that all graces pass through her hands, the false idol stated, quote, I do not dispose of all graces. Jesus prefers that you address your petitions directly to him rather than through the intermediary like me, unquote. Near universalism is present also, or the heresy that states that all men are saved. When the idol reports that most every soul today in the modern world ends up in purgatory, in other words, saved. And then we must consider the position taken by the various local ordinaries and bishops and their insistence that nothing supernatural is happening at Magigori. 
When a lady first allegedly appeared to the six youths in 1981, she reportedly told them that she would only appear three more times. Three more times, that's it. She has since appeared, according to the alleged visionaries, nearly 50,000 more times. The local ordinary for the diocese in which Magigori is located had this to say not too long ago. He said, quote, considering everything that this diocesan chancery has so far researched and studied, including the first seven days of the alleged apparitions, one can say, quote, there have been no apparitions of Our Lady at Magigori, unquote. Furthermore, the same bishop noted that, quote, the apparitions have been studied by several commissions at a diocesan level, by the Croatian Bishops' Conference, the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith studied the phenomena on two occasions. The local and national commissions arrived at the conclusion that there is nothing supernatural to the apparitions, unquote. And then we must consider the strong opinion of the bishop and exorcist, namely Monsignor Andrea Gemma, on the topic of Magigori. He states very bluntly the following, the apparition at Magigori, quote, is an absolutely diabolical event around which numerous underworld interests revolve. I'm referring to the devil's dung, the bishop said, to money. What else? He continued, at Magigori, everything happens for the sake of money. Pilgrimages, overnight stays, the sales of things. In this way, abusing the good faith of the poor people who go there with the idea of meeting the Madonna, the false seers have set themselves up financially. They have married and live a wealthy life, to say the least, unquote. You know, none of the seers have become a religious or a priest. They all make a good living solely from their association with Magigori, especially with one quote-unquote visionary whose home in Massachusetts is valued at approximately $1.5 million. The alleged seers' spiritual director in the past was a father Vlasic, who was laicized. Laicized for sins of impurity, and was ruled guilty of promoting doubtful doctrine, guilty of manipulating consciences, guilty of suspect mysticism, guilty of disobedience towards lawful superiors. According to the pseudo-visionaries, the gospel, forgive me, giggles at times. She makes her appearances according to the whims of the visionaries and can be canceled if there is a scheduling conflict. The gospel goes through wardrobe changes and lets people step on her robe at times, even becoming grubby in appearance due to those who touch her. The gospel, we're told, almost dropped the infant Jesus. The idol moves up and down, we are told, at the behest of the seers who seemingly control her movements. But for this talk, I would like to note especially the statue of Our Lady of Magigori. That is the way Our Lady is depicted in the statue is of great interest. You see, the statue of the gospel wears a long dress and a light veil upon her head. Her feet are covered by the dress, and the cloud she floats on also completely covers her feet. In other words, those feet that heel, in particular, crushing the head of the serpent with an apple in its mouth. That heel, that foot, is completely covered up. Satan both hates and fears the heel of Our Lady's foot, so her feet must be covered up. And believe me, the covering up of the feet of the gospel is significant, for the gospel serves the serpent, but would never crush him. In the inerrant sacred history of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, to be exact, we have what is sometimes referred to as the proto-gospel, the first gospel, the first indication 
of the redemption of mankind from sin. After the original sin, there is the promise of the child and the mother who will give him birth. But there's also an enemy relationship established. The text of Genesis 3.15 shows Almighty God addressing the serpent in the following words, quote, I will put enmities, enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel, unquote. Much of Marian artwork, at least in the West, depicts the serpent under the foot of Our Lady. Heaven itself confirmed this image when the Mother of God appeared to St. Catherine Labore in 1830. There were various elements of this vision, and among them was an image of a serpent crushed under Mary's feet. Satan has never had any power over her, and has always been crushed by her from the moment of her conception onwards. And that is why on December 8th, 1854, the very Feast of the Immaculate Conception, Blessed Pius IX solemnly and infallibly declared the following, quote, We define that the doctrine which holds the Blessed Virgin Mary at the first instant of her conception by a singular privilege of grace of the omnipotent God in consideration of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind, was, keyword, was preserved, free from all stain of original sin, unquote. But then the same Holy Father added, quote, the most Holy Virgin united with him, Christ, by a most intimate and indissoluble bond was with him and through him eternally at enmity with the evil serpent and most completely triumphed over him and thus crushed his head with her immaculate foot, unquote. Now to say that Mary crushes the serpent is not to imply that she does so independently of the power of Christ. Pope Pius IX makes it clear above that it is because of the unbreakable and intimate union with Christ that she can crush, can, can crush the enemy of our salvation. Furthermore, involving his servants in his work is simply the Lord's way of acting. He always remains the source of whatever power is exercised against the devil or for the building up of the church. But if we were to do everything by himself, if we were to do everything by himself, there would be no need for prophets, no need for priests, no need for apostles, no need for teachers, no need for instruments. That's what our Lord does, loves to use little created tiny instruments to do his wonders. Therefore, he appoints, he appoints his servants to carry out his will by the power of his holy grace. As the inerrant scriptures indicate, the Lord has appointed his mother to crush the head of the serpent by the grace of God. Now, the truth of the Immaculate Conception is seen in both sacred scripture and sacred tradition. Again, the book of Genesis records that there has always been enmity between Our Lady and Satan. But if she were conceived in original sin, such enmity would not exist, but rather there would be a common alliance. In King Solomon's Song of Songs, the Canticle of Canticles, we have another proof of the Immaculate Conception in the passage which reads, quote, you are all beautiful, my love, and there is no blemish or stain in you, unquote. And certainly, the Gospel of St. Luke records the very words of the angel Gabriel, those words that would become a part of the Ave Maria. Hail Mary, full of grace, grazia plena. The fullness of grace would be lacking if she came into this world in the state of sin. 
And yes, there is the witness of the fathers of the church, those ancient men so closely connected with the teachings of the apostles. One father of the church wrote, quote, He who formed the first Eve without deformity also made the second Eve without stain or spot, unquote. Another ancient witness writes, Mary was never infected with the venomous breath of the serpent. And that is why Our Lady deserves our praise, for as the Bible and tradition tell us, she is better than Judith of old. Our Lady is the highest honor of our race, and she is the glory of Jerusalem. She is the lily among thorns, an offshoot of grace, not wrath. And yes, she is mankind's proudest boast. She's mankind's singular boast. But another powerful proof of the Immaculate Conception is based upon old-fashioned common sense. As the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen once observed, if a man could make his own mother, wouldn't he make her perfect and beautiful? Wouldn't he protect her from any harm, from any fall or blemish? Would he not save her from the devil himself if he could? Well, the Son of God did literally create his own mother and he made her immaculate. Another common sense argument is used by the Franciscan theologian, Blessed John Duns Scotus, who was the greatest defender of Our Lady's singular privilege. Scotus stated, potuit decuit, ergo fecit. Roughly translated, well, God could do it. He ought to do it. And by golly, he did create Mary without any stain of original sin. Scotus provided that key word, which makes this mysterious teaching most reasonable. Whereas we are cleansed from sin at baptism, Mary was saved by God in an extraordinary way by being preserved from the stain of sin. I mean, there's two ways that you can save someone, right? You can either pick them up after they have fallen in the first place, or you can catch them and prevent them from falling. Mary was saved, redeemed in an extraordinary way by Christ her Savior, making it possible for her to be the one who would crush serpent's head from the beginning. May we become members too of her heel so that Satan may be crushed in our life as well. God bless you.